we have talked about how do we send data using signals and we've looked at some of the characteristics of those signals including bandwidth, frequency, data rate. Now we want to look at the thing between the transmitter and receiver. So we transmit a signal from our transmitting device and it's received by our receiving device. But what's the thing between those? Well, what's the media that our signals pass via? That's what we want to talk about. We call it the transmission medium, a single one medium or the different media. And in one simple example, one of a transmission medium is a LAN cable or the copper wires inside this LAN cable. So we'll look about the, the, the cabling that we can use to connect a transmitter and receiver as well as some other issues. We'll first introduce more generally for all the different media the issues of the range of frequencies we have available. If you recall from our signals, we said every signal we transmit is not at just one frequency, but it's across multiple frequencies. It has frequency components. And the set of frequencies in that signal we call the spectrum of the signal, and the width of that spectrum we call the bandwidth, and that's an important characteristic. It turns out that we can't use just any frequency. There are a limit of uh, frequencies that we can use to communicate. So we'll look at what range of frequencies we have available and talk about uh, some applications that use those frequencies, which we'll also call the spectrum, or more precise, the electromagnetic spectrum. All possible frequencies we have available to us. So we'll talk about that first. Then we'll talk about different media, giving examples from first what we say guided media. Guided means wired. The signals are guided through some conductor or some material. And we'll give three examples of that. We'll finish that today. And then in the next lecture, we'll look at wireless or unguided media. And we'll look at different concepts of wireless transmission, things like antennas, and how much signal we lose when we transmit across some distance. So today, we'll just do spectrum and guided media. Transmission media, the thing between the transmitter and receiver. That's what we want to look at. And the signal propagates through this thing, through this transmission medium. When you design a communications network, you, would like, you need to choose which medium is best for you. So some of the factors to consider, well, a medium that will give you the highest data rate. Generally, we would like to transmit as much data as possible. Sometimes we care about distance. Okay, you want to set up a, a, a network that covers the entire country. Then you would like to use some medium or some links that go as far as possible so that you don't have to have multiple transmitters and receivers. You can have as few as possible to cover a large area. So distance is sometimes of interest. With respect to signals, we've said one of the trade-offs with bandwidth is that increasing bandwidth increases data rate. That's good, but it also increases cost. So generally we'd like to minimize or we, we have a constrained bandwidth. We can't just use any bandwidth we choose. We want to minimize transmission impairments. We don't want noise. We don't want too much attenuation. And the different types of media will, will have different amounts of noise and different amount of attenuation. So choose one that's best and different media will have different costs involved. For example, optical fiber costs more than uh, our LAN cables, our copper wiring. So we distinguish between wired or, un or guided and wireless, unguided media. Just recapping on what we know about our signals that we want to send, this picture we've seen before it shows a signal, a practical signal in the frequency domain. What it shows us is this signal, the blue line shows that the signal has frequency components ranging from down here up to here. But most of them, most of those components have the highest magnitude, that is contain the most energy from about here to here. 
Okay, if we think of the if we plotted impulses, then the highest ones are in this range of frequencies. So if we define some cutoff, some low and high cutoff, we think that the signal that we transmit has a particular bandwidth. Although that does have components outside here, they're very small that we can almost forget about them. They contribute very little to the signal overall. So a signal that we transmit, two characteristics we care about are the frequency or the centre frequency usually and the bandwidth of that signal. And we've said larger bandwidth, larger data rate. But the frequency that we can use and the bandwidth that's available to us is limited because there are a limited range of frequencies that are usable for sending signals, uh, our communication signals. So we must uh, be aware of what range of frequencies are available and that's defined by the electromagnetic spectrum. We'll see a picture in a moment. All possible frequencies that we can use we'll define and all of those frequencies need to be shared amongst multiple users. Users in different and in the same location and amongst different applications. So in practice what happens is that usually government authorities national and then agree on an international basis, make laws or regulations that says who can use which frequencies. One example is that the government licenses or auctions off uh, a license to use the mobile phone frequencies. So if you, a company wants to set up a mobile phone network they need a license from the government to use that particular range of frequencies and that has some cost involved. So all the frequencies are usually regulated in some manner. And the regulations set up such that many different users can make use of those frequencies to send signals, uh, but also that we don't interfere with other users. If two different users transmit a signal with the same range of frequencies, they will interfere with each other. And in the transmission impairments that we saw last topic, we said interference is a form of noise. The more interference, the more noise, the, the less data we can deliver. That's a bad thing. So what is this electromagnetic spectrum? Well, here's a picture that roughly covers the range of frequencies that we can use for communications. And in fact, there are two pictures, the top one and the bottom one. So we'll, we'll focus on the top one first and explain what it shows us and then briefly look at the bottom one. Just maybe zoomed in a little bit more. Same pictures. First, what does it show? Follow this solid black line here. It shows the range of frequencies we have available. So it starts from and the frequency is, let's see these dashed lines, starts from 10 to the power of 0 hertz, which is 1 hertz. And the scale goes up to 1,000 hertz, 1 million hertz or 1 megahertz, 1 gigahertz. 10 to the power of 12 is what? What are the prefixes? After giga, tera, 1 terahertz. Okay, we have... 10 to the power of 12 will be 1 terahertz. 10 to the power of 15, petahertz. 1 petahertz. And 10 to the power of 18, I can't remember. Exahertz, maybe, EXA. And 10 to the power of 21, I definitely don't know. So we know about kilo, mega, giga, tera, at least. You should know about them. Uh, and the others, well, you may know about. So that's what this picture is showing. The range of frequencies from 1 hertz up to 10 to the power of 21 hertz. And these rectangles give us some names of those ranges of frequencies or the bands of frequencies. So some common names. Uh, some will recognize, some may be new to you. For example, the small one in the middle or here, this small rectangle means that the frequencies of visible light are in this range, or a little bit less than 10 to the power of 15 hertz. So the light that we see ranging from what colour? What's the lowest colour? 
red, ranging from red up to in a rainbow, what colours at the top? I can't remember either, but I, I think the top one's purple or vi violet. Okay, so the range of frequencies of light fall in here, the visible light range. The frequencies below that are given the name infrared. Below red, infrared here, so from about 3 terahertz up to the visible light, and above visible light, ultraviolet. Now that's not used for data communications very often, but that's the name that's given for that range of frequencies. Above that, X-ray and, and gamma rays. So we, we're not going to focus on them. For data communications, it's mainly below visible light. So what have we got below? Terahertz is this small range here, but the two common ones that we'll come across a lot are the microwave range and the radio range of frequencies, radio frequencies, sometimes RF. So that are the, some common names given to the sets of frequencies that we have available to us. When we send signals at different frequencies, the, we may impact upon how much data we can send, but it also impacts upon uh, how well our signal propagates. Does it go through the wall or not? How well does it pass through water? And humans are made up mainly of water, so how well will it pass through humans and, and will humans, say, interfere or, or attenuate the signal? So different frequencies will pass through obstacles in different manners. So when we choose a communication si system and design a signal, we need to select a frequency that best suits our needs. So let's look at some examples of communication systems and see what frequencies they use. One we've mentioned before is Wi-Fi. And we said that the Wi-Fi access points commonly use a frequency in the order of about 2.4 gigahertz, 2,400 megahertz. So this line here just shows us that Wi-Fi is about, so 10 to the power of 9 is 1 gigahertz. Note it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, so Wi-Fi is about in this range, about 2 gigahertz. That's all we're showing. And when we transmit a signal from my laptop to the access point on the wall, that signal again contains multiple frequencies, it contains a, has a bandwidth of about 20 megahertz, and it's centered on one particular frequency. There are different channels like 2.412 gigahertz, 2.437 gigahertz, they correspond to different channels. But that's all within this range. Uh, 3G or mobile phone systems in general, when we use data access and, and your, your voice access, uh, they have different ranges of frequencies. One of them is a, uh, typically around the 2 gigahertz. So a common frequency band for 3G is 2.1 gigahertz, 2,100 megahertz. Other ones are at 1,800 and 1,900 megahertz and there's some lower at about 850 megahertz and 900 megahertz. Different telecom companies, AIS, True and others, may use different frequencies. Okay, so uh, it's not such a problem now, but in the past, maybe three, five years ago, when you bought a phone, you wanted to buy one that supported the frequency that your operator w used. But nowadays, the phones support all different, all the wide set of frequencies. What else do we know? FM radio is about what? What's your favourite FM radio channel? Anyone? Anyone listen to FM radio? 10 oh something point something megahertz. So it's about 100 megahertz FM radio. So that's around here. So this is 1 gigahertz, 100 megahertz, or 10 to the power of 8. AM is about 1 megahertz, so something about 900 kilohertz. Radio stations are from 900 to about 1,000. Satellite TV, maybe you receive satellite TV, then the signals beam down from the satellite to your receiver in the order of several gigahertz, 2, 3 gigahertz. It may differ in some satellites. So there are examples, in fact, of wireless systems. 
most of them don't overlap. That is, my mobile phone doesn't transmit at the same range of frequencies as my Wi-Fi device. If they did, they would interfere with each other. So the government regulations set it up such if you're using Wi-Fi, you should use these frequencies. Mobile phones use a different set of frequencies, designed so that they don't interfere when people use them in the same vicinity. Uh, what else can we look at? Your microwave oven, what frequency does that use? When you zap some food, microwave uses about usually the same frequency as Wi-Fi, in fact, about 2.4 gigahertz. So if you're cooking some food in the microwave and you're trying to use Wi-Fi, they may interfere with each other. But it's usually not a problem unless maybe your laptop's inside your microwave such that your Wi-Fi won't work. There are other applications. These are just some common ones that we may have heard of. Let's also mention some wired or guided media. And we'll spend a little bit more time looking at each of these guided media examples, but just to show you. Your telephone line at home, not your mobile phone, but the landline telephone, the one with the cable that goes into the wall and goes out to the telephone network, and also your LAN cables okay, that you plug into your, your computer. These use copper wiring. Okay, so if we will look later, there's copper wires in here. And they're called twisted pair wiring or twisted pair cables. We'll explain them in a moment. But the range of frequencies which are transmitted across twisted pair range from about 1 hertz up to about, this is about 100 megahertz. If you follow the scale, 10 to the power of 6, 10 to the power of 7, 10 to the power of 8, about. It's logarithmic. So twisted pair, when we transmit a signal, the bandwidth of that signal sent across those cables is about from 1, up to, from 1 hertz up to 100 megahertz. So what's the bandwidth? Minimum component, 1 hertz. Maximum, one me 100 megahertz. The bandwidth is a difference, which is about 100 megahertz. Okay, so the bandwidth, when we send a signal across twisted pair, is about 100 megahertz. Another wired system we look at, and you may have it if you have cable, cable TV at home, or maybe cable internet access, or even the cabling between your audio equipment it uses coaxial cable. And we'll explain the, the name shortly, but that's another type of medium that's used. And that carries signals with frequencies of about one kilohertz, up to one gigahertz. What's the bandwidth? Or maybe a, a different question. Compare twisted pair versus coaxial cable, two different wired media. Which one has larger bandwidth? Twisted pair or coaxial cable? When we transmit a signal across these wired media, which one can transmit a larger bandwidth and therefore potentially a larger data rate? Twisted pair ranges up to about 100 megahertz, so a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. Coaxial cable is 1 kilohertz up to about 1 gigahertz. The difference is about 1 gigahertz. Okay. So the bandwidth of twisted pair is about 100 megahertz. Coaxial cable is about 10 times greater about one gigahertz. And generally with coaxial cable you can get higher data rates than twisted pair. And a third system that we'll talk about in, in a moment is optical fiber. What's the bandwidth shown in this diagram of optical fiber? Approximate it from the, the, the picture. try to work out the approximate bandwidth of optical fiber, just roughly. So here we get up to about, what, from 1 up to 100 megahertz, that's an M. This is about 1K up to 
one gig. So the difference for twisted pair is about approximately 100 megahertz. Coaxial cable, it's approximately one gigahertz bandwidth. What about optical fiber? Roughly, it goes, the, the highest frequency component is about 10 to the power of 15. The lowest is about 10 to the power of 14. Note, we have 10 to the power of 12, approximately 13, 14, 10 to the power of 15. So 10 to the power of 15 minus 10 to the power of 14 is, it's about 10 to the power of 15. Less than, of course, but when we compare it to the others, it's, it's 0 0.9 times 10 to the power of 15. Compared to, or how many gigahertz is that? 1 gigahertz is 10 to the power of 9, so this is about 1 million gigahertz. My LAN cable has a bandwidth of about 100 megahertz. My coaxial cable for cable internet or cable TV is about 10 times the bandwidth. Optical fiber is about a million times the bandwidth of your coaxial cable. Okay. So with optical fiber, we can send at much higher data rates. And we'll give some examples later. What, what do we send across optical fiber? Look at the frequencies. It includes the visible light. We, in fact, send light through very thin fibers, fibers of glass or plastic. And the light passes through them, and that light represents the data. So just some examples of different transmission media and where they sit in the electromagnetic spectrum. There are not so many examples above that be very specialized. Most of them are in the radio and microwave bands. The other part on this diagram, it also shows the wavelength. What's the equation for wavelength? It'll come up in the exam when we do calculations. You'll need to know what is wavelength. What's the equation? Does your phone show you the equation for wavelength? Lambda equals the speed of light divided by the frequency. That is, the wavelength lambda of a signal is the speed of light, C, or about 300 million meters per second, divided by the frequency. So this plot also shows some example wavelengths. So 3 kilohertz is, has a wavelength of uh, 100 kilometers, 10 to the power of 5 meters. 300 megahertz has a wavelength of 1 meter. And we get smaller as we go along here. What else do we see? The second diagram. So we, got, we have some names of some of the range of frequencies. They're not very specific. Radio covers from 3 kilohertz up to about 300 megahertz. And there are different applications in there. Some other organizations have given other names to some portions of that spectrum. Some of you, them you may have heard of. On this picture we see some names and we see they're split from 3 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, times 10 up to 30, 300 kilohertz and so on. These frequencies are given names as listed here where the F means frequency, M is medium frequency. L is low frequency, H is high frequency. So just some names given to ranges of frequencies. VLF, what's under low? What's lower than low? Very low frequency, VLF. Ultra high frequency, very, very high frequency, super high frequency, extremely high frequency, and tremendously high frequency. Not very uh, 
smart names but effective for here and I think you may have seen some of these abbreviations or heard of them before, especially UHF and VHF. They are used in uh, some handheld communications but especially used in TV broadcast. If you pick up free-to-air TV, not via satellite, not via cable, but just from the antennas on your TV, then it's usually using either UHF or VHF. If you have satellite uh, TV or satellite internet access and you look at the specs of your satellite receiver and the frequency it receives from the satellite up in space, then usually it's labelled with one of these other bands. So there's some different names. So from 1 gigahertz up to about 40 gigahertz, there are some nut bands of frequencies labelled by letters usually, like C band from 4 to 8 gigahertz, KU band, KA band are some common ones used for satellite communications. So when you subscribe to a satellite operator and you get the satellite dish at home, usually that antenna will be designed to receive a signal in one of these bands, like C-band or, or KU-band, depending upon the application. The purpose of this is not for you to have to remember all of these abbreviations and names, but to be aware that we have a range of frequencies available for us. And they are separated into different uh, groups, and importantly that regulations set up such that only certain applications can use those particular ranges of frequencies. So the government sets up regulations. I'll get, show you an example of a, an allocation of the frequencies to different applications. You don't have this but because it's, it's so detailed that you need to actually look at it online, printing out doesn't help. This is, we'll zoom in in a moment, this is the, the US frequency allocation chart. It summarises how the US government allocates different frequencies for different purposes. Nothing to see yet, but what we'll see in a moment when we zoom in, it ranges from I think 3 kilohertz or 3 hertz, 3 kilohertz up here, and it goes across and wraps around and we'll zoom in, I think this is 3 megahertz, 30 megahertz, 300 megahertz. It goes up to, I think, 300 gigahertz here. So from 3 kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz, they define what types of applications can use those frequencies. So this is allocated by the government, the US government. There's an equivalent one for Thailand. It's just not in so much color, but it, it shows the details, or not on one, one picture. And we'll, when we zoom in, we'll see some of the names here. They're quite general. And the colour coding corresponds correspond to the different types of applications. Before we look at them, we'll look at the, the, the naming scheme, the legend here. And we see that some of the, the colours corresponding to different types of applications. It doesn't specify which company or which uh, specific application has that frequency, but the types of applications. So you, you can see there's aeronautical mobile, so for planes, or planes uh, uh, for satellites, for radio astronomy, so getting signals from space, uh, amateur radio for maybe handheld radio or, or um, home operators. For location services, so things somewhere in here, GPS would be covered. The signals that the GPS satellites send down to your phone, so your phone knows where you are. That's a location service. For navigation, many satellite type up operations. Mobile, so mobile phones would fit under here. Land mobile uh, versus aeronautical and I think Maritime, so out on the sea and so on. Space and satellite. Broadcasting is like TV and, and radio broadcasting. So they're the, the types of applications that this picture shows us. And we will not look at uh, too many of them, but let's try and find some we're aware of. Uh, 
For example, let me zoom in. TV broadcasting. This scale, it's 54 megahertz up to 72 megahertz is used or allocated for broadcasting channels 2 to 4. This is in the US. And it's similar in Thailand. I'll show you another picture that shows that. And some different applications for mobile, for uh, planes, for space applications and so on. TV broadcasting 5 to 6, FM radio in the US. So this is our 88 megahertz up to 108 megahertz and some other applications here. And a lot of them, you see there's a lot of satellite applications, satellite space operations for communications from Earth to satellites and even between satellites or between objects in space. So these regulations are set up so that different users will not interfere with others. And if we scroll down, we'll see, I think the, this is about 1.7 gigahertz, 1.8 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz. The mobile ones listed here are usually for mobile, mobile phone systems. Okay, so um, 3G, 4G systems uh, would fit within some of these frequency ranges. But there are many others as well. And the last one, this 2417 up to 2450 <coughs> is generally reserved for, well, for multiple purposes, but includes Wi-Fi in this range, 2.4 gigahertz. This one's hard to look at in detail on the screen, so maybe you look at that in your own time. There's a link on the website. Let's find another one that maybe makes more sense to you. For TV, in particular for VHF, this shows for different regions in the world for very high frequency range of bands in different regions, the TV channels and what frequencies they use. And Thailand fits within the scheme of Western Europe, uses the same scheme. What TV channels do we have here? Free to air TV channels? I don't watch TV. Can someone tell me? TV channel in Thailand? Yes. Three, five, seven, nine. One of them it doesn't, isn't, isn't named by the number, but there's 11, I think, NBT maybe 11. Okay, it is actually channel 11. And there, then there are others which are maybe UHF, which we'll not see in this. So you'll, you know, I think, of 3, 5, 7 and 9, there's also 11. What frequencies are used? Follow the yellow ones that applies here. So channel 3, for example, when the TV station transmits, it has an antenna at the TV station, it transmits and it transmits a signal and your TV antenna receives that. We're not talking about satellite or necessarily cable here. Think of just picking up on your TV antennas. Channel 3 uses frequencies from about 59, uh, yeah, 54 megahertz up to about 61 megahertz. 54 to 61, a bandwidth of 6 to 7 megahertz is the range of frequencies used, say, for channel 3. And the other channels use the same bandwidth. So each channel is allocated the same bandwidth. There's a gap for the TV channels because this is used for our FM radio up to 100 megahertz. Some other applications, some marine, so on boats, radio, and then we get channel 5, channel 7, channel 9, for example, is about 
200 megahertz, 202 up to 208 megahertz for channel 9. So each TV station transmits a signal at the same time, but they use different frequencies, different center frequencies, such that they don't overlap. And your TV, when you change the channel, at least on the old style TVs, analog TVs, when you change the channel, your TV tunes into that particular frequency and receives that signal on that range of frequencies. So just another example of the use of the, the spectrum for different communication applications. Any questions before we look at guided media? And we'll look very quickly at guided media going through three examples, twisted pair, coaxial cable and optical fiber. First two examples of guided media, we use electrical cables. The way that it works, I'm going to untangle this. The way that it works is that we plug our cable into a transmitter and the other end into the receiver, and the transmitter, transmitter generates an electrical signu, signal that goes onto the conductor. And we'll zoom in in a moment and see that there's, say, some copper wires inside here that conduct the electricity. And the electrical signal goes to the other end and the receiver receives a signal and the data. So just using electricity to send our data. Copper is a good conductor of electricity. It's commonly used uh, in data communications. Now the problem, so that's uh, use uh, electrical cables. The problem is when we send electricity through a conductor that the energy goes through the conductor but it also radiates out outwards. You can think it's traveling through the wire, but it's also spreading out. And that can cause interference on nearby wires. So when we have some wires nearby each other, both having a signal across it, because the energy radiates out, it may interfere on the other wire. And interference is bad, it creates noise. In the same way that our wire, when the electrical signal is sent, the energy radiates out, our wire can pick up energy from neighbouring wires. So that causes interference. So we don't want interference because it means we won't be able to send much data. We'd get a low data rate or lots of errors. We receive poor quality signals and that makes it difficult to communicate. So the challenge then is how can we still use electrical signals but minimise the interference? Well, different approaches. It turns out the shorter the cables, the less interference we'll get, the less we'll pick up from others. But that's a problem if we want to cover a long distance. We can't just have every cable being 10 centimetres. Because if I want to connect my computer to the, the switch down on the third floor, we need a longer cable. So we can't just restrict every cable to be very short. It's ineffective. If we keep our cables away from other cables or other sources of electricity, we can avoid interference. But that's also hard in practice. Think of the LAN cable going from this PC. You can see it at the back here, maybe. It goes into the wall and then through these uh, conduits and up through the, the cavities in the wall and down to, the, I think, the, th the second floor computer centre. But there are many other nearby cables audio cables, other data cables in here, power cables, all containing electrical signals. It's very hard to keep your data cable away from other sources of electricity and therefore to avoid interference. So the third approach is to try to design the cables so that it protects them from any interference. So that they don't radiate energy out and they don't pick up energy from other sources. Two approaches. Use some materials outside the cables to shield them, so provide some shielding so that it doesn't pick up interference. And 
if you return to the very basics of physics, you see, think about the way that uh, electricity flows. You can organise the wires so that they sort of cancel each other out and don't cause interference on others. And that's what we get with twisted pair and coaxial cable. Twisted pair, and while I talk about it, I'll pass around some examples. Twisted pair is taking copper wires and twisting them around each other. There are not many examples, so have a quick look and pass along. I've got one left. Examples of twisted pair, but I'll show one on the screen as well. What you're seeing what I've passed around is just cuts of uh, a land cable. And if you can't see it in front of you, you'll see some things like this. It may not be the same. So all we've done is cut the land cable up. And if you look closely, the land cable inside it, so inside this outer coating, this white coating, there's in fact multiple wires inside. There are in fact eight wires. You should be able to count them. Eight copper wires inside. In fact, the copper wires have some plastic coating on them as well. And you'll see there's some different colours, like the blue, orange, brown and green here. And they go in pairs. That is, each pair of copper wires, usually there's a solid colour plus a white with that same colour. So blue and blue and white. Orange and orange and white and so on. If you look closely at those pairs, you'll see that they're twisted around each other. That is, the blue and its partner, blue and white, they're twisted around each other. And that twisting is such that when we send a signal, signal down those pair of wires, they, the signal that radiates out effectively cancels each other out and they don't interfere much with the neighbouring pairs. So we can send a signal down the blue one and it will not cause significant interference on the neighbouring wires, either inside this cable or even other cables. So that's the idea of twisting the pairs to reduce the interference. And you need to go back to some basic physics to work out why, and in particular, the twist length has an impact. If you look very close, you'll see that they do have different twist lengths. Some are tightly twisted, some are looser. And again, that's to avoid the inter interference. So twisted pair, we have a pair of copper wires usually twisted around each other. A LAN cable has four pairs, but other systems may not have four. Okay? Telephone lines are another common example of twisted pair, very common in telephone networks. Specific for LAN cables, that's not the topic of today, but uh, there are four, four pairs. We send a signal in one direction on one pair, so we send the signal on both wires in the pair, say the green one, I can't remember which colour, but say the green one we send in this direction, and that device at the other end can send a signal back on a different pair in the opposite direction. We get full duplex communications. Rem remember full duplex, we can send in one direction and at the same time be receiving from the other direction. And we achieve that by having different pairs of wires. In your LAN cable, with some of your computers, the older computers, it only uses two of the four pairs. One for transmit, one for receive. In devices that support one gigabit per second Ethernet, it uses all four pairs. So for two for transmit, two for receive, to get a higher data rate. Maybe I gave away the answer to my question. What data rate can you get for a LAN cable? You plug this into your laptop, the other end into your switch or router at home, how fast can you send? How many bits per second? No one's done that before? Tried? 
measured. If you look at the spec maybe of your computer, the transmitting device, it will say what data rates it supports. Most devices today support 10, 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, and 1,000 megabits per second, or one gigabit per second. So normally the devices at each endpoint will negotiate to choose the highest that both support. My laptop supports 10, 100, or 1,000. If I plug it into this PC that supports 10 and 100, they'll only use 100 megabits per second. But if this PC supported 10, 100, or 1,000, then they would negotiate up to the higher speed of 1,000 megabits per second. It depends upon the devices. So 100 to 1,000 megabits per second is typical for LAN cables. You can get higher, there's 10 gigabit, gigabit per second Ethernet, but generally nowadays it uses optical fiber. You can use coaxial, uh, copper wires, but most of them use fiber. The purpose of the lecture today is to just to give you three examples of guided media, not to look at the details of them. So twisted pair is one example used in telephone networks, in building networks, uh, LANs, for example, and has different types of cabling. These wires have an outer uh, coating, this white coating on the outside. It's quite bendable. It's referred to as unshielded twisted pair, UTP. The, the white coating doesn't provide much protection from interference. It doesn't really provide shielding from interference. You can buy a different type, more expensive, called shielded twisted pair, STP. And what that does is it provides more protection from interference. And therefore, if there's less interference, we can send faster. So shielded twisted pair is better for performance. The problem with the shielding is that the cables no longer bend, they're much more rigid. And if you can't bend the cable very well, it's very hard to place it through the, the conduits and through the walls. So it's not very popular to use shielded twisted pair. It's very hard to use. Unshielded twisted pair is very cheap and very common. And the, the quality of the copper wires and the coating and shielding leads to different categories. So you may hear of category 5, category 6, 6 LAN cables. So there's one example of a guided media. Another one, which I cannot pass around, I don't have a copy, uh, an example. Coaxial cable. Maybe you've used it for cable access, a uh, cable TV. So maybe in your, your apartment building or dorm building, there's cable TV coming into the back of your, the TV. There's a coaxial cable between uh, components in an audio or hi-fi system sometimes or for, from a satellite uh, receiver to your TV is commonly used. Again, coaxial cable uses an electrical conductor, usually copper, and we send a, a signal across that copper conductor. To minimize interference, rather than wrapping two conductors around each other, they use a different physical property and they have one conductor inside, then some insulation around it, so this is a cut through the cross section here. The inner conductor takes the signal then there's some insulation and then there's an outer conductor and the physics of it is when you send an electrical signal the outer conductor protects the energy from radiating out any further and from picking up energy from other sources so this is really two conducting materials the inner one and the outer on the same axis so we call it coaxial cable the outer sheath is just the outer protection on that cable It has more shielding from interference than twisted pair 
and can generally achieve higher data rates. It has uh, a larger band bandwidth, like we saw on the electromagnetic spectrum, and can send across longer distance than twisted pair. We'll put some numbers to them in a moment. Used for cable TV, audio, video, some long distance communications, like connecting between offices across a city, between cities, or maybe between countries. But it turns out nowadays most of such connections have been replaced with optical fibre. Coaxial cables not so common in such long distance communications. So optical fibre is our third example. It doesn't take an electrical signal, it takes light. We have very thin hair, like the th thickness of a human hair. A fibre made of plastic or glass, and you have a light source at the end point, and the light goes through that fibre. For example, reflecting off and is received at the other end point, and that's used to carry our data. This uh, optical fibre is generally much more expensive than the other two. The materials are more expensive. Dealing with the fibres, very thin fibres, is much harder than with uh, the copper conductors. So much more expensive. But it has advantages in that we don't have interference from other electrical sources. It's a light signal, not electrical signal. So as long as we can keep that light signal inside and keep it dark from outside, we will not have interference from other sources. When light propagates through the material, it doesn't lose so much power compared to electrical signals. It doesn't attenuate so much, lower loss, meaning we can send it across larger distances. Much higher bandwidth than the others, leading to higher data rates. So a single fibre can s support the equivalent of hundreds of electrical cables. So instead of having 100 electrical wires, we can have just one fibre, smaller space occupied, which is an advantage in some cases. That was the picture of the coaxial cable. The inner conductor, some insulating material, and the outer medical metal conductor here is really providing protection from interference and just the outer plastic coating. And not, not a real picture because it's hard to see the individual fibres but with optical fibre usually they're inside one cable there are the very thin fibres and they need a lot of protection to make sure that the light is maintained inside, there's no light from outside sources, and that they're not broken, because they're very thin. So the other parts are just the shielding or the protection around those fibres. So a single cable may have many tens of, maybe even hundreds of fibres inside that cable. And that's all this picture is showing, that we have fibres and then protection, multiple layers of protection for those fibres. I've passed around some LAN cable. I, we cut it up. I cut it up. If you were energetic, you could take those pieces and join them back together again. Okay, you find the copper endpoints and just wrap them around each other and you could join them back together and it would work. Okay, we just carry the electrical signal through the copper conductor. You can't do that with optical fibre using your hands. The fibres are so fine that we need special equipment if we cut them to join them together. And that's one of the issues with the high cost of optical fibre. Not just the material, but the high cost of installing it, changing the length and so on. So to summarise, just our three examples of guided media. Two types of electrical cabling, one optical cable, 
twisted pair and coaxial cable give us data rates in the order of about gigabits per second. Twisted pair up to one gigabit per second, coaxial cable can go faster. The distances are about two kilometres up to ten kilometres. That is, with a single cable, with twisted pair, the maximum we can get is about two kilometres. Let's say you want to build a network or a link from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. What, about 900 kilometres. If you wanted to use coaxial cable, every ten kilometres you'd have to have a special device that received the signal and then transmits across the next cable. This special device is some form of repeater. Every 10 kilometres you have a special repeater device to, so that you can cover the long distance. Each repeater costs money and is, is, is uh, difficult to operate. So one of the problems with a short distance is that it's hard to cover, of course, a very long dif distance. It's more expensive to cover. Optical fibres we get data rates in the order of hundreds of gigabits per second per cable. And the distance is about 40 kilometres. Some can go further. So again, going from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, every 40 kilometres we'd need some repeater. So for one repeater here, we'd need four if we used coaxial cable, or 20 if we used twisted pair. So that's why having a longer distance is a, of an advantage. Even though optical fibre has high data rates, it's very expensive. So it's only really effective if we want to carry a very high data rate. If I want to send a movie from my uh, computer to my TV, I don't need hundreds of gigabits per second. I only need tens of megabits per second. So a LAN cable is OK. But if I want to send all of the internet traffic from everyone in Chiang Mai out through the gateway in Bangkok, then hundreds of gigabits per second is maybe important. So when the amount of data to be transferred is very high, optical fibre becomes cost effective. And I think that's the main points that we want to make about those three examples of guided media. We're not going to look at the details of the characteristics, just be aware of different types of guided media and maybe some of the trade-offs, which one's faster, which ones cover the longer distance, which ones are cheaper. <laughs>